Good to see some familiar names and faces. Hello, Professor Rachel, how are you doing? It's muted. Uh... Dr. Chris, let me know if we can start after maybe a minute. Yes, okay. Hello everyone, greetings from India. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the second global lecture on a very significant topic by Dr. Khal. It is a matter of immense pleasure and honor for all of us to have esteemed presence of all the stakeholders from both the universities. We welcome everyone and we are very happy to share that today's session is second collective initiative by the School of Liberal Studies, Pandit Dindyal Energy University and Salisbury University. Today, as a part of the global lecture series, the distinguished speaker will be sharing his valuable insight on climate change and liberal studies. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. Karl Mayer, Professor of Psychology at Salisbury University, uh, who is having an interdisciplinary training in behavioral medicine and clinical health psychology. He has a clinical and a basic research background in cardiovascular behavioral medicine, focusing on psychophysiology of stress. More recently, he has broadened his scope to examine how physical and mental health interface with issues of global concerns, such as environmental health and climate change, using a transdisciplinary ecological system approach. Here, he has developed a cross-cutting conceptual framework to help researchers educators, and the general public to understand complex phenomena, for example, the role of human and environment microbiomes in health. Also in this area, he has developed some of the first interdisciplinary courses on climate change, including psychology and global climate change, which he has co-taught at Salisbury University since 2013. Dr. Carl, thank you so much for accepting the invitation and I request you to kindly address the participants. Thank you, Dr. Ritu. That was a nice introduction. And um, uh, it's really an honor to be able to do this and connect overseas. So um, I'm gonna get right to it. And um, just recalling last time, Dr. Paraboom gave a really uh, interesting background and present day account, I think, of the liberal arts. And I think that provides a good foundation for uh, applying all this to climate change today. And I'm going to use liberal arts and liberal studies interchangeably. Um, and what I'll present in some ways really parallels my own story um, in terms of how I came to uh, study climate change. And you know that story really is that I have a pretty broad interdisciplinary background in behavioral medicine. And I think that background has uh, helped me kind of appreciate how the liberal arts apply to climate change. 
And so today, um, you know, that transition is really um, about systems. And I'll be talking about that a bit today. Um, and when you think about climate change, there's a lot that goes into it. And some of you are more or less familiar with all of that. And we'll touch on that a little bit. Now, I think um, the complexity of this is what I hope to come uh, convey to everybody. And to really address this, I hope you come away with an appreciation of how the liberal arts uh, are really essential for us to be able to address the problem. And really the liberal arts are really by definition, uh, a very broad class of uh, disciplines and some would define it differently than others. But I think um, because it's so broad, I'm not going to cover everything uh, possible. And maybe in our discussion, we'll have a chance to really kind of interrogate that a little bit. But um, instead, I'm gonna provide some conceptual framing to help us appreciate how all these diverse disciplines really fall within the liberal arts. Um, and those that don't fall in the liberal arts, how they really come to bear on climate change. Um, and because there's no real consensus uh, or expertise uh, in terms of how people uh, define liberal arts as applied to climate change, um, I'll share some insights of my own work um, and psychology, uh, but there are some other examples as well. So. For context, I think we need to understand the significance of climate change. And there are different angles on this, but one that really stands out to me is just in September, uh, something happened that's, in my recollection, never happened before. Some 200 medical journals around the world released a joint editorial. And that was uh, captured here um, in the title, uh, calling an emergency to uh, limit global temperatures but also to restore biodiversity and identifying these two factors as core threats to our health and the future of humanity really. But this isn't really the first time. Um, back in 2017, scientists, in fact, about 15,000 uh, scientists signed on to a letter warning humanity, not just about climate change, uh, but also biodiversity loss, other types of environmental threats. And this was the second notice. After they did the same thing in 1990, they observed that um, not only have things not changed, but they have gotten worse in these respects. So this is not an academic issue. It's not hypothetical, it's real, and it's, it's very significant. So when we think about um, how we know all this, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, they assess the scientific evidence, as do other bodies, but the IPCC especially, um, they review the evidence and they issue reports every several years. And it's quite a process with literally, you know, hundreds and actually thousands of scientists ultimately giving input. Uh, and the goal is to guide governments around the world, um, not to tell them what needs to be done, but to give them um, a synthesized understanding of what's happening with our climate. And the conclusion is pretty clear. Um, we're doing some significant harm and we have been to our environment and particularly the climate uh, in recent decades. It's widespread, it's getting more intense and this is really unprecedented. So if we take a look, um, you know, you could see the spike there in global temperatures according to uh, or relative to estimates of what temperatures were over the past 2000 years. And in the past several decades, we can see kind of in our lived experience, uh, certainly since the 1980s, every year pretty much uh, average global temperatures have set records. So again, this is uh, unprecedented change um, and these changes have a number of physical impacts and this is just a very cursory look, but not only do we have in increases of CO2 um, concentrations, but other greenhouse gases, but in effect, this is causing global warming which is melting our planet's ice and raising sea levels at a very high rate. Um, and again, unprecedented in the past couple thousand years. Now, the impacts of these are wide ranging. Um, what you might expect with global warming, we're having more extreme heat, but more extreme weather in general. And that can translate into heavy rainfalls and drought, depending on what region you're in, 
uh, and sometimes we see both. Um, in California here on our West Coast, um, they just got inundated with, uh, with uh, precipitation and we see, you know, not far from there, cases of drought. Um, so uh, the impacts are, are quite profound, but climate change also affects people and communities. And that's what uh, I think the liberal arts really uh, bring to the issue um, as well as some other things we'll talk about. And the ways they affect, uh, the climate affects us, um, certainly mental health, a little more, more on that in a moment, but um, stress and anxiety, but also our interpersonal relationships, um, the stresses from acute events like um, you know, hurricanes, uh, typhoons, those can result in post-traumatic stress disorder. But also in our communities, uh, climate changes can affect our social stability, whether it's food supply or migration because of changes in climate where it's more difficult to grow crops. Um, all of these things lead to disruptions in our social communities. And of course, on the individual level too, we have physical health. Um, and for that, we can take a look at more closely how all these physical environment changes lead to um, you know, ecological changes, whether it's uh, air pollution or uh, increase of allergens. And all of these things really kind of uh, radiate out to many different types of threats to our physical health. So if that weren't enough bad news, um, the problem is even more complicated. In 2019, the Lancet Commission, um, the Lancet is a major medical journal based in the UK, and they have commissions. And the Commission on Obesity um, collected uh, evidence, um, experts uh, on obesity, really did an intensive investigation of what causes obesity, which is a enormous threat to health globally at this point. And one might not think that obesity would relate to climate change, but in fact, what they determined was that obesity is intricately related to climate change. And to help understand this a little bit, um, to think about what a significant actually is, it's when you have more and more diseases that interact in some way, and the outcomes are worse than if one disease was present by itself. So take the example of COVID-19, and we know that uh, people uh, are at much higher risk for infection. Um, we'll go back to that in a second. Uh, infection, um, if they are overweight, for example. So those two disease states interact in a way that leads to worse outcomes. Now, one of the things that drives syndemics um, by definition really are uh, systemic problems, social problems that we might call diseases, whether it's poverty, systemic racism, or inequalities in general. Now, these really interact as if they are a disease themselves, and um, we'll just comment on that in a moment. But to help appreciate the syndemic of climate, um, obesity, and undernutrition, think about our food. And for many of us, especially in the West, our diets does not look like this. Um, not all kinds of varieties of fresh plant-based foods. And rather what we often have is uh, mono agriculture, mono crops, um, very singular types of plantings um, and livestock is, is kind of industrialized and our diet reflects this and it's physically not healthy. Um, and in fact, what we see is worldwide increases in the very types of things that we really shouldn't be eating for our health. And the vertical white line there shows kind of recommended amounts of intake of different types of foods. And we are, are very far from that. And this is around the world, a pattern that's happening. More red meats, uh, less plant-based foods. And this is in direct contrast to what dietary recommendations are. Um, so we have a real problem here for health, but also the implications of this are that um, there's an environmental impact here. The production of this kind of food, uh, when it's industrialized like that, it is very carbon intensive and the transport of food is uh, very carbon intensive. 
Um, and this is just kind of a, a quick snapshot of this idea of a syndemic affecting our health as well as kind of the environment. But driving all this, again, um, are kind of power structures and profit motivations that really prioritize profit over health. So we can think about this also extending that, um, as I said, this gets complicated, but um, we can also appreciate how other disease states come uh, into the mix here. If we consider for a moment uh, the concept of one health, um, the notion that you know, our personal health is really connected with the health of the planet around us and the animals that we share the earth with, um, you know, the same environmental impacts um, that we see with climate change. So if we're talking about industrialization, that impact, impacts the climate, but also impacts our environment. And that environment in turn affects our health in direct ways, um, but it also affects the health of uh, animals. And in turn, that increases the risk of zoonosis or uh, animal-borne diseases. And COVID-19 may be one of those as an example. So when we take this kind of big picture, um, well, to say the least, it's, it's complicated, right? But climate change specifically, even though it's interrelated, we can try to look at that and problem solve with that. Um, but fundamentally, it's a human problem. And it's a human problem in terms of the causes and the impacts of it, as well as the solutions that we have to engage in. So our future really depends on our decisions. Um, and here you see different scenarios of carbon emissions that have been put forth by the IPCC. And you can see that global warming is likely to occur in many of those scenarios, but the lower that we can make our emissions in the next hundred years, um, and even before that, uh, the better. But it's complicated. And so what I wanna talk about a little bit is how do we deal with this complexity? So convergence research is kind of a, a buzz term that's been popularized uh, recently. And in the US here, the National Science Foundation had 10 big ideas of 2016 and convergence research was one of those. And really it's about taking a transdisciplinary approach to addressing complex problems that society is facing. And this is done through very deliberate um, deep integration of what's known in different fields and different methods, um, and really trying to develop new ways of thinking about problems and merging these efforts into a unified whole in terms of solutions. So it's not just um, disciplines coming together. Um, if we think about disciplinary research, that's people doing research kind of at the same time, um, but not necessarily communicating. Whereas interdisciplinary, you have maybe teamwork where you're sharing knowledge, and that's still an improvement, of course. But then the idea of transdisciplinary is really kind of finding that space of common discovery and understanding. So if you have innovation from one discipline and a second discipline, that's limited. But transdisciplinary is really kind of looking at that fusion of, I guess, the kind of the cross-pollination and the novelty that comes with converging on problems um, together, working together, and really cutting across all this to um, arrive at solutions that aren't owned by any particular discipline. So to access this, uh, I think we can draw on psychology and philosophy and even medicine to help conceptualize that problem. And if we recall, thinking about some of the impacts that we talked about, right, we've got the, the physical, uh, biological, um, the psychological, and really the social areas, we can take this and view that in terms of a biopsychosocial model. And this model was originated in the, the medical field uh, some 40 years ago. And it really is focused on all of these different uh, domains of influence and the convergence of them is where we can understand health and disease. But I think we can also take this and apply this to climate change and a lot of other complex issues, because where these biological, psychological, and social factors intersect is where we might find that transdisciplinary space of discovery and kind of common 
solutions to move forward with climate change. So if we take these domains uh, and appreciate that they really interact with one another, we can also kind of extend this, um, what I've done to develop a ecological systems view from this, which essentially means looking at these domains at different levels of analysis, okay? And this looks a little complicated, but it's not too bad when you think about it. Um, we all know that there's kind of a physical environment around us, right? Um, our natural environment and the built environment, our roads, bridges, cities, um, buildings, and our physical bodies. Um, so that's kind of in the physical domain. But then psychologically, we have all kinds of ways of thinking about um, our behaviors, um, our emotions, and socially, we have all kinds of uh, ways of looking at different levels of analysis in social realms from our individual relationships to education and, and how we approach uh, policy. And then on the bigger, kind of most, most distal, broader level, um, how factors like economy and politics and our cultures really shape our understanding of these things. And through the arrows, we can appreciate that these things interrelate in a way that's uh, dynamic and uh, really ecological. So if we frame climate change in these terms, um, we may better be able to communicate about the complexity of this and get at more of a transdisciplinary approach. So I want to focus here a little bit on the social aspect because that's where a lot of the liberal arts um, are housed. I would I would interpret that at least, um, and at least traditionally defined. And it's not just the sciences that are important when we're talking about convergence research or transdisciplinary efforts about climate change, even though it's a atmospheric concept, right? The the climate. Um, it is, again, a human problem. And transdisciplinary efforts um, don't often get this kind of um, attention in terms of the role of communities. But it's essential because the word transdisciplinary, it means that it's transcending disciplines, not just one discipline to the other, but it's transcendent, right? It's, it's transcending the disciplines and by definition, it must include community perspectives. And so research is really conducted um, not on populations, but with the populations. And people who live in communities, they are the experts in those lived realities. And though those perspectives are vital to really understanding uh, a path forward. Okay. So with this, um, as identified with the, the global syndemic of climate obesity and undernutrition, um, there's an emphasis on valuing uh, indigenous values and knowledge and really engaging with communities um, directly and not just extracting data and writing papers, but really making that um, science work for the communities in ways that they are part of determining um, how that is uh, really set up and how it's used. So, I think that lived experience um, is vital and certainly part of what we see in the liberal arts. And I have an example here that I often use with my students to really illustrate the importance of not just the arts and humanities, but also kind of that community base in terms of how important it can be for research. So this is a short video that it's a few minutes long and you may need to turn up your volume, but it is somewhat subtitled in English. So um, turn up your volume if you need to. I'm feeling apprehensive about this performance because the audience is made up of the very people that this Pokdan is based on. They've spent several months telling me how climate change impacts them on a daily basis. So I hope this Pokdan performance does justice to their stories. হাজারো পরিবারের মাঝে দুটি পরিবার হাজেরার পরিবার আর ঝর্ণার পরিবার দেখব সরাসরি দৃশ্যে আসুন তবে সবাই মিলে দেখি কি চলছে এখানে হচ্ছে একজনের সাথে আমাদের দেখা হয়েছিল হাজেরা নাম যিনি হচ্ছে যে ময়লা পানি জমে থাকে ওই ওই প্রবলেমটার কারণে স্কিন ডিজিজে আক্রান্ত তো আমি ওনার রোলে অভিনয় করছি কয় দিন ধরে হইছে সব 
I'm going to pause this and just kind of interject here. This is occurring in Bangladesh, where in the coastal area, um, some of the impoverished regions are literally living uh, at times underwater. And so this project um, is engaging communities to um, understand climate change and to communicate about it among themselves, as well as um, with scientists. So I might have just stopped it, pardon me. It's because the audience spent several months telling me how climate change impacts them on a daily basis. So I hope this Kafkan performance does justice to their stories. शांति <laughs> change I now have no land that's not how the world experiences troubles it's more about the politics it's about dynamics it's about local uh, choices <laughs> Hello, 
perhaps it was actually making people think about the, the issues that were involved. So I, I thought it worked really well. I also thought it was very useful for providing a critique of the concept of community, which is used rather uncritically by many people. Within the short space of this play, I counted, I think, at least six types of conflicts between people who live in this so-called community. We need shelter. We have no house, no home. It was a, a very, very powerful experience. This made us care, and that's something that neither science nor policy is successful at doing. We have been trained into the belief that only certain forms of inquiry are valid. We in the climate community, development community, scientific community need to remember that there is a reason why performance was the earliest form of communication. It's because it reaches us. It reaches us at a level that is more likely to motivate action. We as audience became aware that we can change something. That moment was very powerful. It wasn't actually a traditional pop song. Uh, they made a riff off a traditional pop song and went into an issue that needed to be resolved. And they drew the audience into debating on that particular issue in an extremely effective manner. In the end, the audience were the theater. One of the participants who works with uh, both scientists and uh, slum-dwelling communities in India told me afterwards that she's going to go back and do this. And she said one of her problems is getting scientists to actually talk in a language that normal people can understand. It humanizes what otherwise would be a fairly complex and uh, difficult to understand and theoretical uh, and technical issue. And, and I felt that they did that very, very well. OK, so again, you know, I think they really describe very well the role of some of these um, practices um, in humanities um, and how it really kind of gets at uh, the core issues of the lived experience. And certainly it helps communicate um, with communities, uh, between communities and scientists. But um, in that performance, um, you saw conflict. And part of that reality um, that these people live is conflict and many people uh, across the world experiencing the effects of climate change probably will experience some type of conflict uh, through migration, um, scarcity, things like that. Um, but having this type of community engagement um, really does help, uh, it seems to build community and helps people communicate with themselves and certainly um, with scientists who are working on the problem as well. And we'll share the links to this and some of the other resources uh, at the end. So that's kind of one example, but um, we do have disciplines. And as much as we like to think tr in transdisciplinary ways, um, we do have disciplines. So I wanted to share briefly about um, what students are thinking. And this is a survey I did a few years ago across our University of Maryland system. And some of the numbers are small, but just for illustrative purposes, um, we could see here that there's quite a bit of variation um, on a scale from zero to six, where zero is not at all relevant to six, very relevant um, in terms of how students perceive a climate change course being relevant to them and their major. Um, we can look at the vertical line there in blue uh, as the midpoint of the scale. And there's quite a bit of variation across different majors in terms of how important or how relevant they, they see the issue. And if we divide it somewhat in terms of uh, kind of more of the core uh, liberal studies areas at the top and some of the more thought of as hard sciences uh, toward the bottom there, um, there is some pattern that, you know, some areas definitely see it relevant much more than others. Um, and as you might not be too surprised, we have environmental studies up here um, finding it quite relevant. And um, this is kind of more of a social science and, and humanities focus um, relative to environmental sciences, which is a little more physical science um, oriented. 
And of course, geography and earth science is highly relevant. Um, so this tells me that there's maybe a, a lot of, of work to do with helping people become more aware of how their field is relevant. Um, a little more data I'll just share briefly. Uh, this is a different survey conducted a couple of years prior, looking at how people understand climate change. And in the yellow there is to what degree they perceive themselves as, as doing something to address climate change. And in red, what their perceived stress is about climate change. And across some of these kind of um, applied areas of social work, education, and accounting, um, you know, some perceived understanding of what climate change is, um, not a lot of stress. Um, and so that's true also for other disciplines, including psychology, even health and sports sciences. Um, but what I find is interesting here in um, the geosciences and environmental studies, both have a fairly high perceived knowledge and understanding of what climate change is. Um, but what we see is a difference here with stress levels. And in the geosciences, much less stress uh, compared to those in the environmental studies programs. And one interpretation of this may be that in environmental studies, they are approaching the topic of climate change from uh, a much probably broader perspective and perhaps appreciating some of the intricacies and challenges of climate change, whereas geosciences are probably traditionally more focused on the physical science. And what this tells me as a psychologist is that there's probably a certain psychological burden that comes with thinking about these issues and their total complexity. It can be a little overwhelming to say the least, right? So what do we do in our courses? Well, interdisciplinary courses um, are one way to approach this. And um, we've done a bit of that here. Uh, we have a lecture series, Changing Climate, Changing World. Uh, we have that every spring and we rotate topics over three years, focusing on climate change and then on inequality, which is coming up this spring, and then one on food. Um, this past spring, we uh, taught a course on climate COVID and seeing this endemic. And it was a really great opportunity to kind of literally bring in the disciplines from arts to zoology um, in English uh, from A to Z. So um, that was uh, kind of a unique opportunity to kind of address the current issues of climate and COVID-19. Otherwise, um, for curriculum uh, in the social sciences, I'm going to just draw on psychology briefly because we really don't have time to go over all of the great contributions of uh, whether it's economics or um, you know, political science, for example. But in psychology, with some colleagues of mine several years ago, um, we developed one of the first courses probably anywhere that we know of, uh, focusing specifically on psychology and climate change. And we have kind of broken the course down into a couple different uh, areas of focus, um, we first focus on beliefs and attitudes and the notion that climate change is happening or not uh, in some ways seems like a dichotomy that either you believe it's happening or you don't. But in reality, um, we're not that uh, rigid often in our beliefs. When we look at the population, uh, at least in the U.S., um, there's been identified six different Americas, so to speak. And this is work out of the group uh, at Yale uh, on climate communication with Anthony Lazarowitz and colleagues. And they found that there's really a range of beliefs and engagement about the issue um, from completely dismissive, which is the least number of people, fortunately, um, to those that are alarmed. And, you know, each of these have a connotation of, you know, how much people care and are engaged, um, whether they're outright dismissive or fully involved. And what I'd like to just demonstrate here is, first of all, that there is a range of beliefs. It's not just yes or no. But over the years, we've been seeing actually a small increase in people being a little more concerned and alarmed. Um, and the dismissive um, seems like a pretty stable group. So from there, uh, we also talk about adaptation, things like stress and coping. And just to share a little data here, uh, if we look at anxiety, 
um, and stress related to climate change. These things are closely related as you can see here. And so as you increase in uh, severe uh, anxiety, so does people's stress about climate change uh, increase. And we see a very similar pattern here with depression, okay? So the more uh, depressed somebody might be, the more stress they might experience from climate change. And I think that's important to consider because um, you know, we can't really approach this issue um, if people are not kind of thinking clearly about it, but also as a population, we really do have a sense that, um, you know, what can we do? And often people feel hopeless about it and may not engage in solutions. So mental health is, is important. And part of that is kind of the, the backdrop of this is that um, climate change is sometimes, if it's not directly impacting you in a clear observable way, it also um, is what's called a background stressor. And it's kind of uh, blending in in the background, but it's there nevertheless, whether you're kind of thinking about it in the back of your mind or the secondary disruptions that occur from changes in climate, um, even if it's economic impacts that indirectly you might experience because of you know, changes in uh, crop yields in your region or something like that or uh, disruptions in uh, supply chain and so on. Um, these types of background stressors um, are really going to elevate the general level of stress that somebody has, but then we have kind of acute stresses that happen in the face of, you know, uh, storms, let's say, um, hurricanes that are disruptive in a very um, clear way. So we're really having, everyday life stresses that are going to be kind of exacerbated by the threat of climate. And certainly people with mental health vulnerabilities like we just saw, um, if people are in fact, going back to here, suffering from depression, then chances are they're going to be more stressed about climate change. And so mental health is really something that's important to address here. Um, Let's see what else. Uh, we finally, um, in that course, we talk about solutions and without getting into the details, um, we talk about individual behavior change as well as uh, more broad social change. And I'd be happy to talk more about that during the discussion. Um, but to kind of close here in, in a moment, um, we think about the liberal studies. Um, some people think, well, it's a nice addition, but how practical really is it? Um, but I would argue that it's necessary. And there are limits to technology to save us from these human problems. And so along those lines, um, in the US here, the National Academies of uh, Science, Engineering, and Medicine um, came up very recently with a new suite of initiatives. And I'll just highlight a couple of things here. And partly because, um, Many of our colleagues on the call today from PDEU um, are at an institution which is a strong engineering uh, program. Um, and so the National Academy of Engineering is really kind of orienting more and more toward people, systems, and culture. And to me, that sounds a lot like the liberal arts and in particular, the humanities, right? And the social sciences. And so they're first off highlighting uh, the cultural and ethical and social and environmental responsibility um, because you know, engineering and problem solving of climate change uh, as one example, doesn't occur in a laboratory. It, it's about our lived experience and engineers really need to be um, thinking about this in terms of their solutions. It's also important that we're uh, inclusive and equity is increasingly uh, centered um, in the issue of climate change and other environmental issues. And so um, whether it's uh, political science at the bottom, um, talking about democracy, um, or we're talking about infrastructure and urban planning, these are all things that um, we can do better when we have kind of broad perspectives and disciplines, um, particularly from the liberal arts perspective. So with that, I wanna close and uh, see if we can open up for discussion and questions.
And thank you, Dr. Schleyhofer, for uh, pointing out the community-based participatory action research. Um, it's uh, definitely an area of community psychology and uh, in behavioral medicine more generally. We're seeing a lot of that as well as in this psych social psychology area. So I believe if people want to um, unmute, they can raise their hand and um, Dr. Egan will uh, let you unmute uh, or feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll try to have a discussion here. And at this point, I'm fine if everybody uh, is able to unmute, have a little more of a fluid dialogue. If you would stop sharing your screen too, then I can see the gallery sure. a little better. Oh, yeah, that would help. Let me do that. And people are welcome to put questions and comments in the chat as well. So I know we kind of went um, in some areas that you might not have expected, but uh, wondering if that prompted any questions or anything that folks would want to share about how they've uh, addressed climate change from their perspectives. You have a question for, from okay. Professor Steele. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for asking that about recommendations for best practices for interdisciplinary dialogue about ch climate change. Um, best practices, um, not uh, off the top of my head, but what I will share with you is in the course that we teach on climate change, um, dialogue has been uh, become kind of a center focus of how we teach it um, because we're realizing that um, you know, the science and the actual experience about climate change um, don't always match up. And in today's uh, political and social environments being often very polarized, um, oftentimes it, it's framed as a debate. And in a debate, there's a winner and a loser. And while that may be appealing if you're on one side or another, um, really it comes down to having dialogue and having a genuine uh, discussion with people. And what that means really is to not ask questions as much as listen and really try to understand the perspective of somebody who you're talking with. And when you do that, that really does invite uh, more genuine dialogue and helps us really arrive at kind of a, a common place of understanding. So I think uh, if we look at some of the clinical health psychology uh, tradition, when we try to change behavior, um, it doesn't work very well unless we go where the person is at. So if you are a physician and you're trying to help your patient um, quit smoking, for example, um, it doesn't always work well to just tell them you need to quit smoking. It's more important to really kind of go where they're at and hear from them, well, why do you smoke? Why are you doing this? And what are the pros and cons of it? And what are some options for changing that if you want to? And so with climate change, when people have opposing views, it's very important to be in that space that's kind of a, a shared space of maybe neutrality, um, but at very least um, try to understand their perspective in a genuine way. And certainly you can share your perspective uh, as well, um, but it does allow us to kind of non-defensively have that conversation when somebody knows that we're not here trying to convince you um, because people may be knowledgeable about climate change, but um, there are core beliefs that conflict with that, that knowledge or the reality of the data. And those beliefs run, run deep. And so it's much more of an emotional position than it is a logical one. So having that dialogue is really, really quite vital. Um, Dr. Stiegler um, asking to comment on research uh, on positive psychological impact on individuals who are engaging with uh, the earth, things like gardening, composting, et cetera, 
uh, as a personal lifestyle choice, um, as an individual engagement with climate change? I think that's a great question. And, and in some ways, I think you may know the answer to that. Um, just personally, it's, I think, very therapeutic to get out there and dig in the dirt a little bit just to be out in nature. But there's actually evidence um, you know, suggesting that exposure to nature and green spaces is very therapeutic, um, but also engaging in um, whether it's just enjoying the environment or engaging in activities that might help the environment. So in, in volunteering in communities um, to you know, work on sustainability issues, um, that can be very empowering. So there's really kind of two directions uh, that I'd answer your question. One is kind of the personal stress management value of being engaged with your environments um, and the other is, you know, more directly, practically being involved in improving those environments um, can give people a sense of what we call self-efficacy, um, that you can make a difference. Because with climate change, one of the problems is that it's such an overwhelming problem that people don't feel like their single behavior is going to matter. Um, and that's a difficult thing to overcome because there are millions and billions of people who need to do things differently to matter. But um, we just talked about this in our class yesterday on climate change and the cutoff between one person and millions of people, it's a very gray boundary of where that tipping point is of a critical mass of people. Um, our broader society is individuals. Um, and, you know, same with the voting. Um, one vote, does it matter or not? Well, if everybody says that, then it doesn't matter, <laughs> or maybe it does, right? Um, and so engaging in that way individually is important um, for your own mental health, but uh, for that critical mass of kind of, um, you know, supporting the population to uh, press policymakers to make changes um, is important. Um, Let's see, Dr. Ritu, um, asking to share thoughts about uh, impact of culture and belief systems on climate change, especially from a biopsychosocial perspective. Well, I think, I think that's fundamental, really. Um, our culture um, really defines who we are and our relationship to the world and the earth and to other people. And, this is, this is a big question really, so I don't know if I'm gonna do justice to it, but if we think about, um, you know, practically speaking, our, the example with diet, uh, that's deeply ingrained in our culture and we can't just change that easily. Um, but we are finding that kind of the, the Western uh, industrialization uh, type diet is kind of spreading around the world and quite sadly, it seems to be um, really destroying some traditional cultures. Um, so we're getting kind of, you know, centrally processed, industrialized, uh, produced food um, that's inexpensive and being, you know, really sold and pushed in populations that aren't used to that kind of food. Um, yet, because of economic reasons, that's the diet that they gravitate to. And with that, you lose cultural practices that have been in place for, you know, hundreds and thousands of years that have been sustainable, largely. And so with that, you're losing culture too. And so it's really tied to climate change in terms of what's driving climate change, but also um, kind of the cultural impacts of that um, are equally devastating, but not always talked about. Um, and so I think a, a biopsychosocial perspective is useful in that regard, so that we're not just looking at climate change as a physical thing that we can solve our way out of in terms of um, problem solving. That's vital, of course, but again, these solutions have to take place in the context of the culture and the lived environments that, that we have. Okay, other, other thoughts? And I'm happy to engage uh, more verbally with folks if you'd like. <laughs> 
morning, Dr. Meyer. This is uh, Kyung Nae Jung. I'm working at the same department. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm glad um, I can join uh, your presentation. I'm sorry I was late because I couldn't find the address. And I have a, a point to discuss, I think. I can see um, there is um, imminent uh, uh, risk to all humankinds. And seems like your approach to me is um, an application of motivational interviewing. So most people are in pre-contemplation stage uh, now because we don't know if this is even an issue. And it seems like you are um, saying we need to go to contemplation stage. And in the therapy uh, perspective, there is always some ethical uh, consideration. So we may use the devil's advocate <laughs> approach in that um, framework from pre-contemplation to contemplation and contemplation to action. So uh, could you have any uh, recommendations and or uh, ethical considerations at this stage? I think uh, we are, most people are in pre-contemplation or um, contemplation for some people who are aware of this issue. Yeah, and thank you for that. Are you thinking about Ethically, should we be trying to convince people to think yes. differently? Yes, yeah, I think that's yeah. also a good point. Um, you showed some data, there's some correlation between anxiety and uh, the climate change issue, depressive symptom and climate change issue. Uh, but that, I think in my understanding, that's correlation. It's not causal, uh, cause mm -hmm. and effect. And if we in increase the, the awareness of, uh, imminent uh, risk, then it, it may, it may um, um, increase their anxiety. So I think in that perspective, uh, it may not be very um, ethical in some, some way, some perspective. So to yeah. prepare for the future, dangerous future, future we need to increase uh, their anxiety level from the, the um, uh, motivational interviewing perspective. That, that's why I uh, brought this issue. Yeah, I think that's a great insight and kind of a question too. And what, what Dr. Jung is uh, describing is motivational interviewing, which is really was developed in the substance abuse area to help motivate clients to you know, stop using drugs or stop smoking. And the fundamental premise of that really is to direct uh, help people to create an environment really for self-motivated change. And I think that's really at the core of, of what you're getting at, that I agree that there is a risk um, to helping people become aware of the crisis because especially people who are vulnerable with mental health problems, um, that's gonna be difficult for them to accept that perhaps. Um, and that's why I think it's important to go where people are at and have that genuine understanding for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that it's not just that you're telling them the world's going in a bad direction and it's terrible, um, have a nice day. It's having a genuine connection about it. And there's something about hearing somebody and being heard that is valuable. So if somebody does have stress about climate change, being able to express that in a real conversation and be heard is really valuable. And in the spirit of motivational interviewing, it's never about telling somebody what they need to do, but helping somebody arrive at the point where they're ready to change themselves. And part of that is awareness. And as you mentioned, um, in the stages of change that are associated uh, often with uh, behavior change, people who are in a pre-contemplation stage are people who are not aware or they don't care about a problem. And yes, we could certainly see that in climate change. Um, and yet the solution isn't to educate them and tell them how bad the situation is because that's just going to shut them off. And so we know that population uh, already is probably not likely to change, but there are a lot of people who are maybe open to hearing more about it. 
But like you said, if they have some kind of tendency toward anxiety or depression, just dumping facts and reality on them is, is not productive as much as you know engaging with them and understanding, well, okay, so you've heard about climate change. Um, what does that mean to you? And you know, they may say, well, I don't like to think about it because it's, it's, it's overwhelming. And just being able to hear that and, and understand. And then that's an opportunity to frame it in a different way that, um, yes, this is a problem. It can be overwhelming. Um, have you thought about actions that um, have been taken or could be taken that might make a difference? Maybe you personally, right? Um, and you know, helping the person to see that um, there are actions that individuals can take small, but sometimes you know, framing that in terms of the bigger picture is important. So um, I also would say that uh, back to the original question we had about dialogue is dialogue isn't just a one opportunity type of uh, consideration. Dialogue is something that can be ongoing. And with motivational interviewing and the process of change, very few people, um, anyone on this call has made real big changes in their life just with one try. And so with climate change, it takes time for people to adjust to this reality. I know I heard about climate change years ago, but it wasn't until about 10 years ago that I really started seeing kind of the urgency and the importance of the issue. And still on a daily basis, I'm learning more. Um, I go through ups and downs about, you know, how I feel about it. Um, and it's a process. Um, reality is tough sometimes. Um, and our job um, is not to, you know, convince people necessarily of anything, but it is to be true to the reality. And I think the best way is to engage in a genuine way about it and to not be preaching about it because that turns people off. But you're absolutely right. There, there are mental health considerations on a, a broad population level. And that's what actually got me started in this area, thinking about, well, hmm, psychologically, if people feel hopeless about this, where is that going to leave us, right? And so there are a lot of ways to frame the issue um, that maybe isn't so hopeless. Um, but how you engage, I think your mention of motivational interviewing is very appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Egan, thank you for posting some of the the links there relating to some of the things that uh, I'd mentioned. Um, Dr. Schleyhofer, let's see, um, public policy, um, let's see. Your thoughts on public policy, is it creating the type of change you're mentioning? Um, policy would have significant impact regardless of whether people are invested in reducing impact or not. Yeah, well, I guess my sense is um, that public policy not always, but often kind of follows public will. And if people are invested in climate change, obviously that's going to support uh, enough public will for policymakers to respond. Now, it's certainly possible that governments can, you know, unilaterally impose policy, but we know when that happens, there's usually black backlash um, just for the sake of it sometimes. Uh, we saw that with COVID, right? In the US at least, um, you know, how big of a ask is it to wear a mask to protect people, but people are infuriated by that, right? Um, so there's, I think a balancing act um, that has to be done, um, but really kind of generating the public will uh, to influence policy rather than top-down policy influencing behavior is probably the most important way forward, I would say. Um, and to do that, it really comes down to uh, individuals talking about the issue, but also more social movements um, at, at different levels. And, you know, the silliest things catch on in terms of what becomes a fad. So if, if something, you know, ridiculous uh, can catch on in terms of a fashion or uh, even a song or music, um, I think we can figure out ways as social scientists and uh, certainly in the humanities and the arts, especially as mediums of communication to raise awareness and kind of get that public will um, at that critical mass to influence policy. And of course we need to do that worldwide. 
coming up with the um, next uh, climate summit in a few days, hopefully that um, we see evidence of that. But thank you for that question. Dr. Carl, do, do we want to take any more question or we may proceed with the conclusion? Yeah, whatever you like. Um, I guess there is another session coming up uh, December 2nd and looking forward to that with Dr. Egan and uh, Dr. Stiegler. Um, I think uh, Dr. Mitra has a question. She raised her hand. Oh, Chris, you may need to let her unmute. Yeah, I thank you. Is, is there enough time for one more? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> All right, mine has um, a few layers to it, but um, a lot of the things that you said kind of struck chord with um, the importance of identity development during emerging adulthood, the 18 to 29 period. So you mentioned the systemic issues and the importance of community involvement, and we saw that through the videos that you um, played for us from the Bangladeshi students. Uh, I'm curious about what your recommendations are for populations such as um, such as India, which is a highly populated country in terms of um, the population being so vast and diverse as well. Uh, in such cases, it becomes uh, difficult to reach and translate the gravity of this crisis um, to remote and uh, rural populations. So in my research with emerging adults, um, this is a time of identity development where they're willing to um, give their time to civic issues and uh, volunteer in these issues as well. So do you have any ideas about how college students perhaps could thereby be more involved and work closely um, with these hard to reach populations any way that they could have a role in um, educating? people who would not necessarily understand um, the gravity of the crisis? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I think it, a lot of it will come down to having connections in communities um, to kind of initiate that dialogue because it's very difficult and maybe not even appropriate for, um, I'll say outsiders to come into a community and just start this dialogue um, as Dr. Young indicated, you know, there could be consequences to that that, you know, we don't appreciate. Um, and raising awareness, uh, we might think we're doing a good thing, but in some ways, maybe that could be counterproductive. Um, so I think having some initial connections in the community, but also, as Dr. Schlehofer mentioned, um, kind of the community-based participatory research is vital because whether you're doing research and collecting data or trying to educate a community, you have to start with where they are at and their understanding of the problem. Um, because if you don't, then you're kind of inherently inserting, um, you know, inequalities in terms of, you know, a power differential of, you know, we know everything and you know nothing. Um, that's not gonna get us anywhere. Um, it can be more polarizing uh, and just reinforce, you know, longstanding structural uh, inequalities. So. I think it's vital to have some initial context, whether that's um, you know communities of faith within these uh, groups uh, or populations, or uh, some other types of community um, leaders, and making that direct connection first, and you know understanding from them is there a need and an interest first of all. If there's not, then who are we to go into these communities? Um, but typically, there will be some, um, or at least finding out from what perspective they are concerned about it. And that's a starting point for the, the dialogue, I think. Um, but in general, I think the age group that you're talking about is very vulnerable. And to Dr. Young's point, um, you know, a recent survey just came out looking at uh, adolescents and young adults around the world and really reporting a high degree of climate anxiety. And we saw that with COVID as well, that that group of young adults is strongly uh, impacted by the disruption of COVID. And these are, like you said, in their formative years and forming their identity. And many of my students as well, they, they really have questions about their future and they're very anxious about that. And so I think it is important to engage them um, because they know this is going on and it's 
possible to just kind of try to ignore it for a while, but rather than being overwhelming to them, I think it actually might be beneficial to engage them at the level that they're at and to um, engage them in a way that's appropriate for their, their viewpoint and their boundaries. I think that's, I'll, uh, that's where I'll try to even uh, add something to what Dr. Carl is already mentioning. I, exactly that is what uh, even Government of India has taken as an initiative uh, for a lot of reverse migration framework where um, if we see in Indian system, uh, value for Mother Earth, value for nature and climate, it has been inbuilt part of all the cultural traditional practices. Logic and rationale in some cases were there, in some cases it was not, but then most of the festival if we see in Indian system, they're associated with protecting Mother Earth and ensuring that the nature is not disturbed. Uh, if we uh, see the recent trend in India also, it has got a very in interesting kind of shift where uh, youth is going back to um, these farms and in is interested to become a farmer. This was not something which I had observed two to three decades before. A lot of uh, youth these days is engaging in organic farming and getting into these pockets of rural segment and the, the, the other good part here is that there are some kinds of routes which are connected for all those who are having a urban connection. So there is a scope, there is a space. And definitely what Dr. Carl is saying, I think it makes a lot of sense to understand their part of the story as to how they wish to see climate change uh, intervention from what they are practicing. Yes, um, a larger group of uh, population in the tribal segment or interior part of rural there might be a lack of awareness to articulate their practice in actual way as to how it is contributing to climate change. But the practices in majority of places is happening. A couple of research is happening in India. They're trying to highlight the same thing. Uh, long back, we had certain um, revolutions like Chipko Andolan, where um, even the, the tribals, they were... Uh, trying to protect the tree, even one tree cutting, they were not allowing and supporting. And there was no uh, you know, sensitization or requirement of education for this, because this is an inbuilt part of tradition. But yes, uh, if these two can meet together uh, as a part of uh, either theology or psychology or community engagement, uh, we may see a more uh, holistic and collective initiative coming uh, where there is a stronger route going both from the urban rural segment. Uh, Indian population, definitely, I think uh, I will appreciate the youth right now, which is in the bandwidth between the age group of 23 and 27. They are, um, are having a very high degree of awareness compared to if we see maybe two, three generations before. So that is giving some hope. I'm just sharing as a po pointer to what Dr. Carl already highlighted because uh, that perspective, if we capture appropriately, then we can fit it into the data, which uh, also is a very important aspect in the intervention which are happening at a global level. I just thought it, it will uh, bring some perspective from the Indian side of the story as to what is happening here in, in particular reference. Since I think uh, we have yeah. captured most of the question. Yes, Dr. Carl, you want to add something? Yeah, oh, no, I want to thank you for those comments. It's encouraging to hear that. And my hope is that we see that more around the world, kind of going back to our roots, so to speak, and practices that have sustained people for history. <laughs> and um, technology can't solve everything. Um, so we need kind of come full circle, um, kind of we need a, a broad liberal education, I think, to appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carl, for such an inspirational and informative talk. Uh, and I'm sure the list of both uh, tangible as well as intangible uh, learning, which all the participants, they are going to draw out of this lecture is vast and very significant and important. We need to contemplate more and more and see that those contemplations should convert into action, which we rightly deliberated today. I'm sure such exposure also have allowed the students from India to discover more about them right, with perspective from the global reference and also some new ways to think.
uh, on behalf of PDEU, I convey gratitude to the entire management and faculty fraternity at Salisbury University um, for allowing our students to experience uh, new aspects of learning through this global lecture series. Uh, I again thank uh, everyone for uh, their valuable contribution. I just want to make one small announcement that we are in the process of preparing certificate of participation to all the registered participants of uh, the global lecture series and we'll be sharing the same very soon uh, through the reference con contact point from both the universities. That's all from all of us. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Chris. And thank you, uh, Dr. Ritu. We appreciate it. I put the next information in the chat. I look forward to presenting with my colleague, Brian Stiegler, and trying to do Zoom at the same time. It certainly will uh, not be dull. And so we're going to look a little bit at professional development, preparation, and opportunities. And we're looking forward to that. So thank you all so much. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you for the conversation.